Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw with Recording Studio Rockstars. Welcome to our inaugural episode. This is episode number one. I'm sorry, I owed you an episode zero, and I'll probably go back now and make one that will show up just before this one. But the reason it's our inaugural episode is because I have our first guest for Recording Studio Rockstars. It, this is a guy named Mike Purcell, who is somebody I've known for many years here in Nashville, although this is going to be the most time we've ever actually hung out together in a room. So Nashville's like that. You can have all these connections and people you know from all over, and you can know them as acquaintances. You can be aware of each other sort of in parallel for years and years and years, and you can feel a kindred friendship at the same time even before you've actually spent time in a room together. Um, but now we finally like brought it all around full circle. And so I've got Mike here in the room. Mike is, he's got like a long list of recording, mixing, and mastering credits. He's also an artist. He's a recording artist himself. He has a particular uh, passion for indie rock and rock and roll, which is cool as heck. Can I say hell? I can say hell. Yeah, it's my own podcast, hell. right? All right, yeah. cool. So, because that's where my passion is too. Um, Honestly, Mike is also an entrepreneur with multiple startup businesses, all of which we're going to hopefully talk a little bit about right now. And uh, his credits include such household names as Leonard Skinner, Lionel Richie, Brad Paisley, Cinderella, The Rock Band. Awesome. Your hair's looking good, by the way. Thank Waylon you. Jennings, Billy Ray Cyrus. All right. All right. I got a um, story there. Uh, nice. I can't <laughs> wait to hear that. Jason and the Scorchers. We're going back a bit here. And uh, BR549. So I don't know if our listeners are going to be hip to BR549, but really, really cool band. We'll talk. I'll let Mike explain who they are here. And then uh, there's a credit on there, too. I noticed that you were credited also for working with Mark Pfaff of Igmo. Yeah. Way back in the 90s. Yep. And that's somebody that I also recorded and played with back at that time, too. So a bunch of great stuff. Mike's also um, been on my radars for years because of our distant friends and our close friends here in Nashville. And I'm psyched to have you back here in the studio. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. Mike, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. I, I feel a little bit of pressure, though, because it's the uh, first episode. Oh, nice, man. Well, <laughs> let's see. How can we make that even more difficult? For uh, please don't. Don't you do your best work under pressure? I do. Awesome, dude. Well, so I kind of gave you an introduction to our listeners, our rock stars out there. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and where you came from? You know, I've got a – I also pulled – you sent an amazing bio to me, man. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Um, I could I could also just kind of go through it. And ask no, no, I can talk things. about it a little bit. I'm I'm one of the few people in the industry that is actually from Nashville. So I grew up here. I've lived here all my life, and there's probably like five of us, you know. And when you meet them, you're like, oh, I went to school with your cousin. You know, it just reinforces the inbred thing. But um, I started out. Uh, the way I got into music was I was skateboarding, and I started listening to all this punk rock, and I thought it'd be cool to play guitar. So I got a guitar when I was 14 and I started playing, played in bands and I got in the studio first time when I was 16 and just fell in love with it. So you is know? this like eighties? Uh, it would have been 88, 86 to 88. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, and then, uh, I just fell in love with it and I did the thing where you get two cassette decks, you know, and you yes. bounce stuff back and forth with the radio shack mixer. Hold on, hold on. You know what, dude? We just got to pause right there uh -huh. because that is exactly how I got into multi-track recording and yeah. got introduced to the whole thing, including like, wow, you can make a song. Yep. You know? Um, so I think our listeners won't know what that is yet. They might. Uh, right. Let's break it down for them. Well, uh, way back when, the the best thing you could get for, for your home would be like a four-track recorder, but they were... You know, they were a couple hundred bucks. So what you'd do is you'd get two cassette decks and you'd get a little Radio Shack mixer for like $20 with these RCANs on it. And it had a thing where you could plug a quarter inch into it, whether it's a mic or a guitar or something like that. So you'd record your first pass to one cassette and you'd rewind that cassette and hook up the other cassette deck and hit record on that and hit play on the other one. So... The music would be coming through, and then you would play your instrument, and it would sum into the other cassette deck, and you'd repeat the process over and over. Yeah, but hold on. Let's pause for a sec. Yeah. He might step up a little bit closer. Right. But um, so repeat the process 
specifically means when you're doing the cassette, the double cassette recorder, you have to press eject on both of the cassettes. And I don't want to go on a tangent here, but that brings up the whole thing about the eject test we used to do. Remember the really good cassette players when you hit eject? Oh, they do the soft eject. They do the eject. real slow right. eject, right? And then the cheap ones would go like clunk yep. as they open up. So you would you eject the cassette on both sides of your ca- double cassette player, and then you pull the cassettes out and swap you flip them. them over and swap them and yep. put them back in. Yep. So now the one that just recorded, you know, your your first music plus the overdub of your vocal is now over on the left hand side. They're right. pretty much always left to right. right? Yep. You know, yep. Makes sense. It made right? sense. I don't know if they did it differently in other parts of the world, but over here it was left to right. So then you would add, you'd take, you know, that you'd press play on right, the left right. hand side, and now we'll be playing, you know, that original music plus your voice. Right. And you now layer in another thing through the microphone input. Of course, you had to have a cassette-to-cassette deck that had the additional mic input jack, right? Well, we would do stuff where we would just um, like either run a, run a vocal through an amp and mic it and then come in. I, I guess our Radio Shack mixer, I think it had a mic pre on it or something, but we'd get those big XLR to quarter inch transformers, you know, to plug yeah. them in. So we were doing all that stuff. So it was actually going through the mixer and we were summing in as the cassette was playing, it was getting summed in the mixer and you could kind of adjust the level like that. Well, that's fancy. So you guys had an external mixer and everything. Yeah, uh, A little one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that kind of reminds me of like the first recording experience I had too, was I used to stay up really late on, um, set, uh, Sunday nights, uh, because they had a show, it was called um, Dr. Demento. Right. Do you remember the radio yeah, show? Yeah, He was always on, what was it, Radio One or something like that? Something like that. Yeah, and so Dr. Demento was this show, it was, a, it was a comedy show, and he'd just play funny music for like two hours or right. something like that, or yeah. an hour. And then at the very, very, very end, he would play something he'd call the Funny Five, right? So it was like the original list blog post or something. He would just be like the five best songs and uh, of that week. And at the end, you know, I'd stay up till almost midnight trying to listen to these five songs go by. And that's where I was introduced to like Weird Al Yankovic right, and, and right. all these guys. And so then the only way I could figure out to record was I had my Panasonic handheld cassette recorder uh-huh. and I had my little uh, transistor radio by my bedside. Right. And I would just stick the cassette recorder up against the speaker and have the speaker just blast right into the I, w- I would do that too. Yep. So anyway, yeah. So the, the multi-track... Taking place on the dual cassette stuff. That's awesome, man. So that's when you started. Not, let's let's jump back in. 1988? Yeah, 88 was when I started. And then we, we went into a studio and he actually had, I think it was 16 tracks in somebody's house. And so we recorded there and I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But it cost money, you know, and uh, we didn't <laughs> well, have... didn't have money at 16? No, not really. I think the last day of the studio, we went to go pay the bill and we were like $20 short, you know, and, and uh, he, he told us to give him a copy or something and let us go. Now, now that's like a full day of studio time. Oh, uh, yeah, pretty much. The rates, way rates are going. But then uh, my guitar teacher, he had a TIAC 88 eight track recorder and I would house sit for him over the summer. So all we would do, and he had like a drum kit, he had a room and everything and all these mics. And I would just have all my, all my friends over and we'd sit around and drink beer and just record music for like the entire week, you know. And uh, that's when I really, you know, and, and he had compressors and you're just running stuff through it, twisting knobs. And you, you have no idea what it's doing, you know, and you're just twisting it until it sounds cool. And uh, so I got into that and then that really reinforced the idea that that's what I wanted to do. So I went and got every book. Which part? Working uh, on the A-track or just hanging but, around with your friends all no, week and drinking beer? Uh, uh, both of those. <laughs> but no, the the whole music aspect, the, the recording and the multi-tracking and, and the thing of having the ability to blend different tracks, you know, and change levels and things like that. And so I went and got every single book I could find on it. And uh, I ended up going to Belmont. So, oh, nice. Yeah, I went there from... There you, go. you got a high five from Benjamin. Benjamin right. Benekos. Did I say that right, Benjamin? Yes, so Benjamin is our intern right now at the Toy Box, and he is right behind you through the glass taking notes Uh-oh. on everything you say. It's Uh-oh. all going out on the internet live. Great, great, wonderful. Um, but I went there from 90 to 94, and the thing I did is for some reason I didn't have an advisor, or I like never went to him, so I just made my own schedule. 
And I took like all the recording classes first. And it was awesome. I was like, this is so great. And then I got to the point where it was like, oh, crap, to graduate, I have to take like math and English and religion and all this stuff. And so I'm like, in Nashville, everybody. Yeah. Religion's well, then that was back then, you know, where you had to go to chapel. Maybe you still do. I don't know. Um, and so I got to the point, it just sucked. And I had a buddy that interned out at the castle and he got me hooked up with them. And I, I started interning there in 93, I think. And so I interned there for a year and it was brutal. I mean, it was like, get done with school, go to the castle. And I delivered pizzas at night. So I'd be at the castle. I'd get out of school. I'd go to the castle. Then I'd leave at like 5.30, go drive pizzas until 10 at night and repeat that. And they wanted me there every weekend, you know. So I was pulling like 25 or 30 hours at the studio on top of class and driving pizzas. And so after a year, they were like, look, we'll give you a job. I was like, cool. And I think they paid me like 150 bucks a week. That's that's awesome. Well, man. yeah, but you know, it was like a forty hour week. And uh at that point Yeah, but you were eating pizza for free, right? I I was. I still don't eat pizza to this day because yeah. I can't stand it. But uh I had the choice. I was like I could keep on going to Belmont, which at that time cost like ten thousand dollars a year and graduate, or I could just go work. So I just went and worked. I dropped out. I'm like twelve hours shy of graduating. And the funny thing about it. Um, they have this alumni thing where you can post your stories and they put them up there and they were like, yeah, we'd like you to do one. Cause they found out I went to Belmont. So I take all this time I write this nice thing out. I send it in and it never goes up. And so I finally asked them about it. They're like, Oh, he didn't graduate. We can't put oh, it up man, there. Come yeah. on. You know, like Steve jobs, he got like an honorary degree and they let him be, do the commencement speech. Well, that's not going to happen with me. Dang. So, it. Oh, well, so we're not trying to really, you know, promote, um, you know, dropoutism, is that a word? It is now. It is now. But I have to say, I've known quite a number of successful entrepreneurs who have sort of chosen. It's not about dropping out, it's about choosing your own path, which really right. is the essence of self education and, and getting it done right anyway in the first place. So if you're listening to this podcast show, for example, you're probably um, somebody who is, you know, wanting to learn more about recording yourself. So you're already on that path. So congratulations to you. You are a rock star. So you were at the castle, which is an amazing place. Um, I don't want to get too deep into that, but I did a record at the castle with my brother, probably about a couple of years after you were there. Right. And it's a beautiful place out in Franklin. It literally looks like a castle. And I believe it was a, a famous stopover place for Al Capone, right? Yeah, During he used it for bootlegging between uh, New Orleans and Chicago, I guess. It was kind of the halfway point. So they, But they play that up a lot more than... Hey, you know, you know. our business is stories are important. In yeah, our business. well, and that's a big story. Song, so. it's Songs themselves are storytelling, right? That's so. very true. All right, so um, after the castle, yeah, I know you got a long list of stuff here. So uh, you had one of your credits was going out to LA and doing a bunch of cool stuff. With right. A couple of famous names on there. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. The uh, It was Lionel Richie was the first time I went out and we had spent six months on that record. And um, it was weird because they showed up to town. He didn't have any songs written and they were going to write the whole thing and record it there, which went great. And so... The first part of it, we might work or we might not work. And, and this is this is mid '90s or late '90s. This or, would have or, been yeah. mid '90s, pro- mid-90s. well, late '90s, probably right. like '97. And, and he was kind of like king of the you know, superstar. Yeah, he was. He was the number one song played at weddings is "Endless Love." Oh wow! Yeah. So, uh, Wait, which isn't that written by Matt Gaden? Here? I, Am I, I remembering that correctly? I don't know. Sorry, sorry, Mac, if I'm wrong on that, and <laughs> you're welcome, Mac, if I'm right on that. But anyway. <laughs> That's that's pretty awesome. Uh, but the whole reason I went out there is we had two 48 tracks, the Sony Dash machines and a 24 track locked up. And so I figured out how to make it work because we had everything set up, you know, and you'd put it in VSO and we were locked to Blackbirds because we were 2997. And it wasn't that complicated to me. And they were going out to Conway. And so I called up the tech there. I said, look, man, all you have to do is get three Lynx modules, hook it up like this put everything online. It'll lock up great. And so we go back and forth and I call him a couple of times and he's like, man, I don't think I can do this. And I'm like this, you know, 25 year old kid, 26 years old. 
said, why don't you just come out and do it? And I was like, all right. So they flew me out there and I was out there for like 12 days. I hooked up the machines on the first day and they paid me the entire time. They put me up at Le Park in West Hollywood. And I worked the first day and I hung out the second day for an overdub. And then the rest of the time, the producer was like, hey, you want to go to Universal? So we just take off and go do stuff. So I got to hang out in LA for almost two weeks and hardly did any work. Well, that's still pretty awesome, man. Yeah. So I'm trying to think, like, what would the equivalent be now? It'd be, you know, a young kid coming out and be like, listen, it's not that hard to use Facebook. Let me just come on over there and I'll show you guys how to do all this. Build your website. Yeah, know? well, it was exactly like that. And uh, and then the second time was for Skinner. And I was working with Ron Nevison. And I didn't work on the tracks for Skinner. They cut those at Ocean Way. We went out to the castle. We were there for three or four months doing guitar overdubs, well, just all the overdubs. I got to work with Leon and Billy Powell before they passed away. And they were amazing. You know, it was like two days for them. They played all their parts. Wow. And it was it was crazy cool. And so um producer asked me to go out there with them. And I said, uh, yeah, let me check the schedule and make sure the studio didn't have me booked on something. And then later on that same day... Um, Gary came walking in. He's the he's Leonard Skinner, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, he's a big kind of scary guy. And he came walking up behind me, and I was tuning a vocal, and he used to always call it playing Space Invaders. He's like, "You over there playing Space Invaders?" I'm like, "No, Gary, I'm tuning this vocal." He goes, "You're coming to L.A. with us, aren't you?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I got to check the schedule and everything." He goes, "We know where you live. You wouldn't want us to come burn your house down." And he just turned around and walked out. And like, you never know, you know, with those guys, whether they're serious or not. So I went to LA with them. And then uh, all I did out there was we had Tommy Shaw come and sing on one song. I tuned that vocal and I did a two track edit. And that was 17 days. (laughs) That's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, I love it. It's so funny to hear stories. I mean, even the stuff that we did, like your story, when we started, sounds like mythology compared to making a record today. Right. But when even when we were doing that, the stuff that they used to do sounded like mythology. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's like you hear about people taking two days, three days in a you know high dollar top notch studio just to try and get the kick drum sound for, yep. before they started the record. Oh well we've almost done that. You know, you, you listen to um Tom Petty, he was talking about doing their records, I think it was it's Sound City. Yep. Right, it was in that yep. movie. Yep. And they just took all this time just trying to get the drum sound. Right. They wanted to invent something before they got started. So yeah. that's cool. If you want to start your record today and you want to invent something before yeah. you get going, that's probably good. Yeah. Well, you know, these days it's like drum sounds in 15 minutes, you know? I mean, that's... At least or less. Yeah. Know? I mean, that's that's the standard for me these days. You know, yeah. it's like get it up and get it running because time is money. Well, let's bring us up a little more to the present. So after you did that, you were back in Nashville. Right. And you've done, we, we sort of enter your entrepreneurial phase at this point. Right. Well, it, I kind of started doing a bunch of things at once. I, I got a Pro Tools rig and I was going around different places and working for different clients. And I did a lot of vocal tuning for a couple of years. And then uh, I got hooked up with a friend of mine, we were, we were both kind of geeks, you know, we we're really into digital audio and things like that. And, um, at County Q, I kind of ended up there around 2000. I put all my gear in the room and started working out of there and they were all on radar twos there. And so what we would do, we'd record to the radar twos, which is a hard disc 24 track recorder. It was a really good sound and went first 24 bit hard disc recorder. And we would use that as a front end and we would go into Pro Tools and mix in Pro Tools, but we would never actually record to Pro Tools. You'd just make a bunch of aux inputs and play the audio through it. So you're using it like a console. And the thing we wanted to do was be able to get, and people would want to take it other places that had Pro Tools. So we developed a way to take the radar drives, put them in a Mac, and convert the files from the radar format to... It was, at that time, Sound Designer 2, or Wave Files. You could do that. So we came up with that idea and spent, started a company. You know, that was when money was flowing, you know, and got venture capital and did all this stuff and developed a piece of software that uh, could do it. And we're also late 90s, right? Uh, No, that was probably around 2002. So this is just, this is kind of... um 
Web 2.0. I mean, no, I'm using the wrong terminology. Uh, it but was like Pro Tools 4. Right, but this era. is a, this is a, the sort of the first internet bubble burst was late yeah, exactly. 90s, right? This is a little bit after that. A little bit after that. So this is yeah. people like re, you know, pulling them, yeah. them their bootstraps back up. And yeah, well, and the thing was the software came out right around the time of 9-11, you know, and the oh, economy wow. just tanked and, yeah. and uh, it was just a bad time for everything, you know. And uh, it, it never really caught on and eventually, and we were working closely with the IS guys, or yeah. CTI Creation Technologies was the company that actually I made it. It was the called radio. IZ. Well, but you're on the inside. It's called the IS. Yeah, I don't know. You know, <laughs> it's easier than saying IZ. Well, so let me let me back up a little bit because I think we're we're um, quickly going over some stuff that's right. totally awesome and going to be brand new and unfamiliar to our listeners. So. Radar is a company that was it was originally made by Otari, right? No, it was actually it was like a company in Canada called uh, Creation Technologies that came up with this technology, and Otari licensed it from okay. them. So they had the inroads in the U.S. to where they could do the manufacturing and the distribution on it because CTI itself was a tiny company. You know, right. they they didn't have the infrastructure to get the unit out anywhere. You well, know, so let's let's talk a little bit more about what it was. So. If I was to explain it, I would say that Radar was basically multi-track recording. It was a multi-track tape machine digitally in a box. Correct. Right? Yeah. So it's a so it's a rack unit that you would put up, kind of like, um, didn't Alesis the HR24 yep, or something was a little bit Task like that made idea. made one as well. Yeah. And so then it came with a remote control. So yep. you could have this remote over, which gave you buttons to push, making the whole process really easy as far as managing it. But you still have to have a mixing console. Correct. And all of your outputs would come to the mixing console and you had a screen. Maybe well, that, over that to the came side. that came later. That was oh, a, that was an upgrade. Oh really? The yeah. screen didn't even exist at first? N- wow. Well, I think it did. The waveforms was the update that okay. came out where it was like, wow, we can actually see it, which is just a terrible concept, you know, <laughs> seeing audio. Yeah, you took what was good about it and, and yeah, started to turn it, it into yeah. something else. So um the thing that made it remarkable was uh, I don't remember if there were other m- um, hard disk recording options at that point. I, maybe this was one no. Of the it first, was right? it was the first one. The thing that made it remarkable was the undo button. Right. So you could do takes of stuff, and then you could undo it and go back to where you were. Yep. And which we take for granted now. Absolutely. Computer. And the other thing was it gave you rudimentary editing functions, which was cool because previously you'd have to actually cut tape, and with this you could cut out individual pieces of tracks and fly them anywhere. So it was the first real editing, and you could take things and slide them a little bit one way or the other within a track, whereas you couldn't do that on analog. True. So that kind of revolutionized the way that people thought about making records. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, it, it was a lot easier to cut together takes than getting out the razor blade on a 24-track, rocking the heads, and spending a whole day getting a song put together. And it was also less expensive, right? Because you didn't... You didn't have to buy tape, but Precisely. hard drives were more expensive back then, and tape was less expensive back then. Well, the thing was, you they had an exabyte backup system, so you'd, you'd just get one or two hard drives, you know, the nine gig hard drives, and you'd back them up to these exabytes, which are like uh, eight millimeter video tapes, you know, and you'd spend 20 minutes backing up a song, and then it's yeah. on the tape, and... And they had a thing where you could link them together, you know, if you got started to get into stupid track counts and things like that. That but, is so awesome. Rock, it, rock stars, are you starting to shake and shiver yet? Or is this some scary stuff? <laughs> Exabytes and other things like that? But but the thing about the radar was it sounded so good. The converters in it. There's people today that still use them just for the converters in them. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to get to is I remember that one of the things that was remarkable about radar is people talked about it as sounding as good as tape. You know, Daniel and Waz, I've read articles where he talks about it's the first time he felt comfortable not recording on tape because radar came along and it sounded good enough to him. It it was a phenomenal sounding platform and it was really the first 24 bit thing out there which to me makes more difference than sample rates going between 16 and 24 bit. Interesting. You know, it opens up you get more of the the thing for analog with me is you you feel the depth and the width of it, and 24-bit approximated that a lot closer. So the fact that I'm recording this podcast in 8 bits, is that a problem? No, that's great. That's like Nintendo. Right, cool. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right, great. So you you started up um, – what I love about your story is that you had this idea to start up something right. new. You, you looked at the situation – 
Um, you saw a problem that needed fixing. People loved using the radar, and and you saw people wanting to take it, and you jumped in there, and you just we you did know, it yeah. created something. So you want to talk for just a second about like you know your internal sort of emotional process with that, and what's it like to take an idea and run with it? And um, how many did you have anybody tell you you were crazy? Uh, we we actually had people that got behind us because we had, I was just talking to a guy about it and. Um, He's like, I can get you a bunch of money. You know, people were on board and the studio owner at County Q was all about it. Um, so everybody was kind of behind us, you know, but just taking, you know, it's a really fulfilling experience to take something. You know, it can be really, really frustrating too, because we had to hire a coder and do all this stuff. And we had to reverse engineer a lot of the aspects because Digi wouldn't let us in. They wouldn't give us the Pro Tools format. Um, they were really, really closed off at the time. And, uh, you know, we just kind of figured it all out. And I enjoyed the challenges of figuring. I like figuring stuff out, you know, and figuring out a different way to do something. So, And, and for our listeners, this is early 2000s. Yeah. Um, fellas, ladies, we didn't really have the internet back then. No. We did, but it was like internet was checking some email. It was waiting with immense patience while, uh, you know, a Southwest airlines page tries to load on your computer so you can buy a plane ticket to right. go somewhere occasionally. Um, it was not like it is today. It wasn't this high speed thing. There were no drop boxes. Right. So you did not, um, have a Skype session with your coder in another country. No. You had to get on the phone. Yeah. We, we actually brought the guy here and we were working out of a shed, you know, that had like an air conditioner that could barely keep up and, you know, spending eight hours a day just trying to figure this crap out, you know, and and the thing you do, so you'd, you'd spend all this time doing all the coding and then you'd have to build the software, which would take an hour and you'd go and run it and it would geek out at a certain point and you just have to go back and repeat the whole process. It's like a really tedious thing, you know, but you just, you just have to have the passion to keep after it, you know, and, and keep on plugging away and just not give up, you know, and not get frustrated by it. So. Yeah, that's good advice. So um, for our listeners now too, I mean, you they may, uh, you guys may or may not be thinking about things like developing software, but you might be too. I mean, you know, I think a good word of advice is here you are at the beginning of your recording career and, you know, learning this stuff. You're, you're embarking into a world that's changing all the time with music and bear in mind that what comes next in the music industry, you know, is what you guys invent. Right, you know? right. You know, it's, it's the innovation of it. You know, you come up with an idea and, and don't let anybody tell you it's a stupid idea. You yeah. Know? And so this is coming around full circle here, too. So I know we've we've gone off on like it's all of a sudden it's software development. Right. And it's tech side. But let's bring it back to where we are today. So, um, and actually, you know what? Before we do that, we've right. got to talk a little bit more about County Q because that was oh, okay. a remarkable, remarkable place. Yeah. Um, it, can you tell us a little bit about what County Q was? What, what sort yeah, of place yeah. Was it? I, I think uh, it started out, it was Paul Skolton was the owner. It was Scott Mary. So Paul's a drummer. Scott was a bass player. And they started out in his basement in Donaldson. And they just totally did everything themselves. And they started cutting demos for people, you know, which are – recordings that songwriters will do to pitch to established artists so that their song can get cut and it can get on the radio. And so they started doing that and became successful at it and bought um, bought a building in Berry Hill and put a studio in there and he got a Trident ADB console and they were cut into an MCI 24 track. And they had two rooms in Did that Did it sound building. something like this? It sounded exactly like that. And it looked exactly like that too. Or it looks exactly like that. We're in the control room right now at the toy box. So but, I'm standing uh, right in front of the tape machine. But uh, so they had two rooms there. They had a mix mix overdub room. And they had a tracking room, and and just got really really busy. And and we were just doing demos and demos and demos for everybody. And that you know I think he got the building maybe eighty eight or something like that. And it's still over there, and we're still rocking. Um, you know, but we've done all sorts of songwriters, you know, from, we did Craig Wiseman for, I worked with him for 12 years, you know, and he's got 22 or 23 number one hits now. Wow. Um, just kind of all the people sort of ended up over there. You know, we said, we got a name for ourselves and, and people came. Okay. So when you say demo, um, that is something that 
everybody in the world might be familiar with, but specifically to Nashville, that it, kind of refers, refers to a certain part of the process of making a, yeah, a record, right? Yeah, it's a little bit different. You know, a songwriter will go out and write a song with a couple of his friends or whatever, and they'll make a work tape, just them sitting there playing acoustics, kind of belting it out, because most, not most, some songwriters can't sing very well. And uh, what they'll do is they'll come in the studio and they'll play this work tape, and the the session leader will take it, listen to it, and he'll use the Nashville number system, and he'll chart out the song so you know all the chord changes. And all the guys, you'll get these players in there. You'll get a guitar player, a drummer, a bass player, a keyboard player. And back then, we were using fiddle and steel, too. So you'd have this big seven-piece band, and you get the writer in the vocal booth just kind of trying to keep up with the melody. And they'll record this song. And the thing that's really amazing about it is the sessions are three-hour sessions. So what they'll do, back when we were on tape, uh, they'd get four songs, maybe five, um, in a session, which is amazing because these guys have never heard the song before. They go in and they play it in, like if you're on the third take, it's downhill, right. you know, because they start to learn the song. There's this fire, you know, in the first and second takes. And they'll go in and play it and get everything right. They might fix something where they missed a change, you know. So they play it down. They'd be like, okay, that's okay. And be like, punch me in on chorus one, you know, and out. And then you're done with it. They move on to the next song. And these days we'll do, since we don't have to wait for tape to rewind and all that stuff, we'll do six songs in three hours. So they're spending maybe 30 minutes on each song. And, and, and just a reminder, it. rock stars, these are not songs that are rehearsed by a band where, you know, a band who's rehearsed songs, you might sit there and play six songs in an hour. That's not a big deal. Right. But to learn them, arrange them, write them out, play them, and create something that's worth listening to yeah. again later. Well, you know, and they're listening down to it the first time and they're making changes. You know, they're like, oh, this will work better. Let's put another bar one in there. And everybody marks up their charts and they go out and it just happens. It's it's true. I, I still, I'm amazed to it to this day to go in and watch it happen because it, it's one of the coolest things. Yep. And I got to jump in here and tell a story. So uh, we have a mutual friend, Mr. Chuck Faf. Yes. Who was a classmate of mine at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University. Um, when I finished in 95 and, and moved up to Nashville, and his first gig was going over to County Q. He got a job there, and he was learning from you guys, and then uh, later went on to be an engineer and just do a number of, of recordings there for years. Um, and so he invited me at that time to come in and sit in on a session and check it all out. So I was psyched. I went there, sat in on a four-hour session, and what I saw blew my mind. So um, it's funny because, you know, we talk about terms like terminology, like demo and right. things like that. And sometimes those seem to describe something that is not where the essence of what's great or, you know, about it is. Right. So um, I think that can be misleading because the process you guys did was incredibly masterful. Right. So Chuck, he would come in and I think it was 15 minutes before the session Get and sounds. he would plug in some stuff and get sounds. He was sound checked and ready for a full band recording with some people he knew and a bunch of strangers in 15 minutes total. Now, in order to do this, you guys had created a studio where the drums were already set up in right, the room. You right. know, amps were set up or they were ready for an amp to yeah, be set well, down in front of a microphone. My, mics were always set up. Drum kit was always the same, which is a big part of the the sound piano B3 that stuff was always set. Yeah, so I would say this to you guys to rock stars is that uh if you're doing in the box recording or something there's no excuse not to have your session ready in 15 minutes or less. <laughs> if you're not even using real instruments, you right. better be ready for people yep. to play. But uh that's another story. So Chuck's set up in 15 minutes and then in walks everybody. Everybody's joking around, having a good time. They all know each other. It's just a chill vibe. Everybody's a real pro on their instrument. The band sets up and gets in place. I think the drummer was in an ISO booth. The singer was in a little ISO booth behind the right. control room. The The producer on the session is standing right there behind the console. They were kind enough to let me just kind of sit over to the side of the console and just watch this all happen. Chuck's there running the show, sitting in front of this Trident ADB console. We're on analog tape at this point, so right. there's no Pro Tools. So right. we're in 24 tracks, um, two-inch tape on uh, a JH24, yep. JH16, JH24. JH24. Um, 
And another issue with those, of course, is the different models of machines. Some you could punch in on and right. some were slow. Mine doesn't punch in quickly. Yep. The JH24 maybe had what was called the choir mod. Well, I which, think we, we probably had it modded. Yeah, so. so that allowed you to actually punch in on a yeah. track like you're familiar with um, in a computer. And so the band came in, everybody's, the songwriter comes in with the producer and they played, I think the work take let, tape like that. Right. Somebody took a pa- piece of paper and a pencil and they wrote a chart with the Nashville number system. And that's usually a chart is one page. If you're writing yep. a chart more longer than one page, you're a pain in everybody's butt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you got to have the whole song just on one piece of paper. So at a glance, you can see the entire arrangement of the song. And then they pick the key and the band hears it that one time. I think the band in this case rehearsed playing through the song once. Right. They figure out everything. They all note on their charts. And then they say go. And Chuck presses record on the tape machine. And he's tracking the entire band performing the song. So they performed it once. They nailed it. And then he's got talkback mic, so everybody in their different place has a little foot pedal. Right. And they could press a foot pedal, and they could talk on their mic and talk back to Chuck, who was engineering the session. And then they um, – so they tell him, they're like, hey, can you get me on on the 4-5 there on the th- right. you know, the f- yeah. fourth bar of the second chorus? Somebody else is like, oh, yeah, I just need the whole outro again. The acoustic guitar player says, oh, just give me a double of the whole song. So he just grabs another instrument. And so he gets all these notes from the different people in the song – and uh, vocals, I don't think mattered so much yet, right? right. Typically, vocals. Yeah. Well, that's we've a got a guide thing. vocal, but the the um, important vocals to come later for the final version of this were going to be an overdub. So it's all the instruments. But they, Chuck presses play at the top of the song. He drops it into record. Uh, maybe one track is in record from the top because he's layering a second acoustic all the way down. And then Arm there was another this track. trick yeah. that he did that just blew my mind where as he was coming up to a point where somebody else needed to record, he would arm that track, but it wouldn't drop into record yet. Right. And then he would go over and then hit the record button again. So you were recording on one track and then you drop in for that those extra couple of bars on another track yep. as you go down. And in a single pass, he would get all the punches for all the musicians. Yep. So now we're done with this song. Yep. And now it's like, all right, cool. Play us next the next one. one. Yeah. We're ready for the next one. Yep. And um, you know, the sessions started at ten in the morning, I think. Yeah, ten to one. And uh, so it was at ten to two usually. And well you, by one o'clock. Yeah, if we're you done. Go, if you go past one, you gotta play pay overtime. Nice. So, so three hours and that gave an hour between sessions, and that yep. was the hour that all the musicians and everybody went and had lunch. Yep. Yep. So in that time, in that three hours on the session I was on, they got five songs done. Yeah. And it's all on analog tape. Now, here's another thing. As the engineer on that, you had to look over at the tape. And if you were recording on a reel of two-inch tape at 30 inches per second, that's the speed of the tape. Minutes. You yep. only had 16 and a half minutes on the tape. You were not allowed to press record on the last song yeah. and have the tape run off before the song yep. was finished. Yep. You know, I get away with that now because it's my studio and that's a whole different story. <laughs> but you would not have been allowed to do that. So you had to pay attention to all that stuff. And then if you were sloppy about your use of tape, guess what? You just cost somebody hundreds of dollars yeah. to buy an extra reel of tape yeah. to fit that next song on. Yeah, tape was a uh, hundred fifty bucks, two hundred bucks a reel. Yeah. So it's not cheap. An amazing. Talk about balancing a lot of plates in the air while you're working. Yeah. And and the crazy thing is that was going on at fifty or hundred studios every day for years right here in nashville yep of course we're in east nashville right now but well it's it's still nashville yeah so um that was county q uh they would have three sessions a day i think going all the way almost to midnight yeah we would do a 10 uh so it was a 10 a two and a six right and each one of those was sort of a four hour window yeah and that was just um but it was also like five days a week right nobody was in there on a saturday and a sunday unless you were in there for and you'll be telling us more personal projects yeah it's still you know everybody has families and stuff and on the records you know we'd work for like 27 days straight i love the demo thing because you know we we'd cut a song on a monday put a vocal on a tuesday we'd mix it on a wednesday and you're done yeah you know, you don't have to revisit it and you're not listening to the same thing over and over for six months. And you it's know? not going to show up on the radio. No. So talk a little bit about that because the finished version of it, the yeah. master would show up on the radio. How did that feel? What was that experience like? Oh, I mean, it was cool. You know, the the thing, I did a bunch of the um, Carrie Underwood demos for her second record, I think. They cut 14 songs and I had mixed 11 of the demos that ended up getting cut. And so you'd hear them on the radio and... 
I mean, maybe they would have done it anyway, but they're like, they're like, man, they're copping my trick. You know, it's like <laughs> flying tambourines in on, you know, every other snare hit and the delays are the exact same and stuff. And a lot of times the demo was cooler, you know, yeah. just because it had more energy, you know, it was more off the cuff and somebody just playing it for the first time. So I had a suspicion that was part of the dialogue that was going on. Yeah. You afterwards. know, and there's a lot of writers that feel that way. And, you know, there's one guy, he, uh, he said, I had, I don't know, he had 300 songs cut last year. He said he listened to two of them. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah, I did it right the first time. And that <laughs> was it, wild. you know? That's wild. Now, as an experienced producer, engineer, businessman, do you have a, a finer appreciation for not reinventing the wheel when you don't have to? Like something comes oh, yeah. your way and you're like, that sounds great already. Let's use that and continue well, with that idea. Well, you know, that's the way I produce stuff is I find bands that I like and I don't go in and I don't say, why don't you change this lyric or let's change this chord to that. It's like you find something really cool and you capture it, you know, as it is. You know, we'll do stuff like tweak guitar sounds or work on parts a little bit, but it, it's all them. You know, I let them do the stuff. And I just pick bands that I really love the music of. And more importantly, that I like the people. You know, it's always a fun hang and we're eating and having fun. And, you know, it's more about having fun for me, you know, yeah. and listening to cool music than Well, than well let's talk else. about that for a sec. We're, we're, we're sort of coming near the end here. And I know we got a couple of topics to, to talk about. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, where your passion is with music right now, and then we can finish out with this um, this series of DVDs. That oh, okay. Right yeah, now. yeah. Well, um, you know, I've always played in local bands. And like I said, when I was young, you know, you realized it costs money. And all the bands that I like, nobody's independently wealthy. So I find local guys that I really, really like. And we go in the studio and we'll do EPs, and I don't charge them anything. You know, we hang out, we do it. On weekends when the studio's dead, the studio owner is wonderful. Um, you know, he likes supporting local music, and I do too. And so I find these guys, and they end up being really good friends. And so I'm like, well, we'll just go in and do four songs, you know, because you don't want to commit to this long, ongoing relationship of working for free. But that's what it turns into. And, you know, I, I had one guy, and I'd, I'll do stuff like put ads on Craigslist and not say who I am, just say I'm looking for these bands. And you'll get, like... 15 people that contact you, you know, and 12 of them you don't want to do, you know, but you'll find one or two. And um, I started doing that probably like four or five years ago and ended up doing two records for one guy. Um, and then I got hooked up. That was Prattle on Rick. He did, I did two records with him and it became a really collaborative thing. And then recently I got hooked up with Hurts to Laugh, um, who's a East Nashville band. And they're just kind of like crazy punk rock. You know, we'll do stuff. I've been filming stuff for them where they just pull up in front of a bar or something at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, get their amps out, and they plug into an inverter in the car, and they just play three or four songs. And before the cops come, they load everything up and drive off. Oh, man, so we, we've been filming those. Um and then I did... Uh, well, we were just talking about that. The other day we were yeah. talking about flash mobs for dances. And I was like, what about flash concerts? Is anybody uh, doing flash concerts? Yeah, it we're, sounds we're, like you are. We're trying to do one a month. so And we're, we're documenting all of it. We've got it up on our YouTube channel. Which Should I'll, we? Do we want to tell people how, how our yeah. rock stars can go find that right now? Yeah, it's just, uh, just go to YouTube and search for six minor films. It's the number six, M-I-N-O-R, films. And it'll pop up. It's uh, Hurts to Laugh Sidewalk Shows. And there's a bunch of other stuff we've done there, too. Um, and then I did uh, Tom Pappas Collection. He's from Super Drag, and he's a super cool guy. It's kind of post-punk, you know, cleaner guitars. And um, through Hurts to Laugh, I got hooked up with this band from Cincinnati called Mad Anthony. And they came down, I don't know, two months ago, and we did a couple songs. And they're coming back in August, so... I said, Tom, Tom Pappas, he's got great, awesome hair, too, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He's got a, uh, a white man fro. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, he's cool. Um, well, well, so cool. So um, something that I think is important to point out is your story to me. You talk about this, you know, beginning at the beginning. You learned how to do some stuff. You spent a lot of time working and using the skill set that you had, which, you know, you, you were good at tuning vocals. You right. Know, you, that became like your specialty. Right. And people hired you a lot for that. Right. And 
I think that can be advice to people who are starting out. Sometimes it's good to just kind of focus on being good at a thing, let people know you for being good at that thing. And it can open a lot of doors. You can have a lot of exactly. opportunity because yeah. people need that problem solved, you know, exactly. when, whether it's tuning vocals or whether it was creating Pro Tools sessions from a radar session. Right, right. Um, but ultimately, at the same time, you spent years and years doing many, many records. You know, you've got yeah. like you talked about on your bio um, uh, periods where you were doing a thousand mixes a year. Yeah, the, when things were really slamming, I was doing I was doing five mixes a day, five days a week, and I, you know, I figured forty weeks I worked. You know, and it was it was cool, but at that point it was a grind, and I, I did that for two years, and. Uh, you know, I learned a whole, whole lot. You know, th that was the point where I could find, I can go back and listen to those mixes and I'm like, I don't want to change anything, you that's know? That's great. And, but it took me 10 years to get to that point. So, yeah, that's but, cool. you know, it, it's just learning by doing it. And so I guess part of the full circle that I wanted to get to is, you know, here you are, it, it sounds to me like you arrived at a point where you're like, you know what, my my heart and my passion, what I really love about music kind of comes full circle back to those days of skateboarding yeah. and being in a punk rock band. Yeah. And it's just really cool to hear how you've taken all this skill set and you've created an opportunity for yourself to refocus on um, well, it's doing, on music you love. Yeah, doing the stuff I'm really passionate about and really love. You know, I, it's it's not so much doing it for the paycheck as just doing it for the satisfaction of it. You yeah. know, and it, it makes me happy. So yeah, and um, similar to you, the last time I did a job other than music was delivering pizzas. Oh yeah, and it was it was about the time you were delivering pizzas as right. well. I think, and uh, you know, I think I I re totaled my car on the last pizza run I did. Right, and that was the last pizza I delivered, and that was the last job that was uh, you know anything yeah. to do other than music. So finding a way to just just stay the stay the course. Yeah. Keep doing it, whatever it takes. Whether you got to go tune vocals, whether you got to invent new software, the software, whether you um, mix a thousand songs a day, and you know, or not a day, sorry, a thousand songs a year, and that may not be a thousand of your favorite songs. No, they weren't. But in there, you're going to have some that are favorites and some right, that aren't, right. and and uh, all along the way you stay on the path and you just get better and better. So what, what advice would you have for, um, you know, our listeners that as they're embarking on their music and recording careers, just take every job you can that if it has anything to do with music, I've worked at music stores, I've run live sound, you know, I've done and, and take the gigs you're uncomfortable taking, you know, because you'll learn something new because you're probably uncomfortable because you don't know a lot about it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would avoid those for a while. Now it's like something comes along. I'm like, yeah, put me on it, you know, and, and, uh, here you are doing an inaugural podcast, for example. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know, he called me up and I was like, I don't know if I, I was like, I might as well do it, you know? So, um, yeah, just, you know, and stay after it. Don't give up because, you know, you'll be mixing. Like, I remember the times when you do a mix and you put everything into it and you're so proud of it and the client walks in and you play the first eight bars and they're like, stop the tape, you know? So, and the other thing is don't have an ego about anything because you're just putting what your spin on it is. You know, the, the person that wrote this song really has a lot invested in it. So, the goal is to try and interpret and interpret it in a way that lets their vision carry through. And... uh you know, when they come in and they don't like something, it's not anything against you. You know, it's just your interpretation of it doesn't match theirs. So just roll with it. You know, they're going to listen to it a lot more than you're ever going to. So make it right for them, make them happy, and they'll come back again and they'll keep working with you. Yeah, you know, and another thing that comes to mind is if you make a mistake and they don't like it, <clears throat> I think you can walk away. No, I mean, if you really screw up, maybe it's not helping. But if you're doing things, sometimes doing the wrong thing helps somebody along with their vision because it gives them an opportunity to identify what their vision yeah. isn't. Well, and the thing is too, you know, the, the one client that I talked about walking in after eight bars and throwing up his hands, I worked for, it was Craig Wiseman and I worked for him for 12 years and the last two years of mixes, he never even showed up. So, right. Cause he trusted you. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. He just get, knew you knew what to yeah, do. I knew exactly what he wanted and he would even deliver me these tracks that were just like, 40 tracks of like stuff to weed through and he just let me weed through it and I'd send him this mix. He's like, cool. You know, That's so you, you know, just keep after it and don't have an ego and enjoy it. You know, it's fun. It beats digging ditches. 
That's true. I mean, if you drop your car off somewhere to get it fixed and it comes back working, you may not feel compelled to go hang around with the mechanic while he's doing it. Might just be glad that your car got fixed. Yep, yep, exactly. (laughs) And if it comes back and it's not working, you probably go somewhere else. (laughs) That's right, too. Um, So, all right, there was another thing I wanted to ask you before we get into the... What's that? Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, it's before we get on to your your recent um, film production project, right. which you, you started to mention a little bit with Six Minor Films. Uh, I noticed when I went to go look at your credits link on All Music that it was quite well put together. I wondered if you had advice for um, our listeners as far as, you know, how did you manage to make sure that you had a, a really nice trail of breadcrumbs for your your discography and your credits. What advice do you have for people who want to have credits? I just had an intern over here recently, um, or a new new student, a uh, recent graduate, and he was talking about how he really just wants to see his name on the booklets on CDs, and he wants to work with people who are great. Right. What can you tell people about that? Well, the important thing is getting hooked up with somebody, either finding an engineer or studio you can work at that's doing that sort of thing, and then just working harder than anybody else and doing a better job than anybody else. And they'll keep on coming back to you, but it's a lot of hard work. I mean, there were that Brad Paisley record, there was a 27 hour day on it, you know, the last day. And it it can be just brutal, but they came back and I did, you know, the tracking on the next one. So it's just do a good job, you know, and if you screw something up, you know, fess up to it and and make it right and just do whatever you have to do to uh, to do it right. And, and it's associations, you know, get to know people and be friendly and be open, you know, and, and uh, that's that's what I that's what I did. I think so. that's great advice. So it sounds like uh, you might have to give yourself a little bit of a rest in between some things here and there and catch up on your sleep if you're going to do 27 hour days. Yeah, it was I did that twice and I will never ever do that again. Nice. So. Well, there you go. You put in your time. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the project that you're working on now. You've started a film company. Right. And it's it's you, really cool what you're doing. Well, you know, we have these slow periods in the music business. It's either feast or famine. So some people would say snack or famine. <laughs> yeah, that's more like it these days. But um, I was mixing, I got hooked up with somebody and I was mixing feature films like to 5-1. It's just, it's not fun. There's nothing creative about it. You know, you're making everything sound like a movie. But it, it's good work. You know, it's a lot of work. And so I kind of got dialed into the video thing. and I've always been a little bit intrigued by it. And we hired a guy to come do the sound design for the movie. And we were just like brothers we have the same evil mind you know and and think alike and everything and so we had this idea we had a slow period and I got a video camera I got like a $200 video camera and we got some lights and we wanted to explore songwriters like the process how they do it how they what their goals are their background why they ended up doing what they were doing so we went and filmed a friend of mine the prattle on Rick guy who I'd met through Craigslist doing free stuff and we took it and learned how to use Final Cut. You know, I'd never used it before. So got the book and read it and watched some Linda videos. And we edited There's together. There's a book? There is oh, a book. man. Quick Start Guide. And uh, put it together, you know, and we shot all this B-roll with his music. So his music goes the whole way through. It's kind of a glorified EPK form, but it's like 30 minutes long. So we had posted it on LinkedIn and I had an agent contact me. He said, do you have more of these? And we were like, no, you know, we just did this for fun. He said, if you get five more, I can, I can sell it and get a distribution deal for it. We were like, all right. So we got some more cameras and we found all these different local bands and uh, we ended up doing a six episode series. And when we were on our fifth one, we started shopping it and he got, he was a wonderful agent. It's um, Dan Gerlitz at Soundview Media. And he's in New York, and he's got all these industry connections, and he got it placed at a distributor. So uh, we got a 1,000 DVDs pressed and sent a bunch off, and it ended up in stores all across the U.S., and it's on Amazon. It's on Hulu now. It's called Songwriter. And uh, so we're working on season two now, trying to get funding for it. Yeah, That's cool. I look forward to seeing that. I saw a little bit of the clip that you sent me earlier. Uh, We'll make sure to include links in all the show notes. You got all that right, Benjamin? Awesome. 
I think I have DVDs for you too. I think oh, I, cool, man. Yeah. I'm excited to see that. I'll bring them in. Um, so a question for you. Are you familiar? There's another podcast out there that I was listening to recently called Song Exploder. No, it's I'm pretty not. cool. They go in and they dissect a song oh, yeah. from start to finish. So it starts out with the demo and it follows through the process to the finished one. That that was an idea for, you know, it's like great. That, the ideas you come up with, you know, for these video things and it's it's easy to come up with the ideas. It's hard to do the work. It is indeed. That's a great takeaway for our yeah, listeners. Yeah. It's easy to have the ideas. It's much harder to do the work. Hi, I hope you are enjoying hearing from today's featured rock star. We are just about to head into the jam session, and I want to let you know that all the cool stuff we talk about will all be available in the show notes for this episode. If you would like me to send it directly to you, all you need to do is text jam session to 33444 and I'll send you free content including the show notes. Again, that's jam session to 33444 and I'll send you free content including the show notes. Cheers. What do you feel like was, uh, and, and you can do real fast answers on this if you want, but we call this the jam session on, right, on the end jam. of the, the, the podcast here. What do you think was holding you back at the beginning of starting out doing this stuff? Probably access to the resources, to the good stuff, the good studios and, and things like that. I, you know, I was working with substandard stuff and wanted to do a lot more. Yeah. And that's quite different these days. Yeah. I mean, everybody, you can get a computer and Pro Tools for under $1,000 and have this huge studio in your bedroom. So, um, so for our listeners out there, you've got access. So yeah, there's no reason you shouldn't be doing don't, it. Don't if let I had Pro Tools, you back. If I had Pro Tools when I was 15 years old, you know, it'd be I would have never, now, never left the house, man. I'd have no friends. 90 songs recorded in five minutes. Exactly. All right, so um, what was some of the best advice you remember receiving? If this is extemporaneous and you don't think of something, that's fine. But Do it right and do it once. Do it right and do it once. I like it. I have a book that's about uh, carpentry called uh, Measure Twice, Cut Once. Same principle. Yeah, so it's the idea of being prepared. You know, you guys talk about County Q doing five songs in three hours. And what's the preparation? The preparation is that the song was written well on the way in the door, right. hopefully. Yep. The preparation is that the studio was already set up to accommodate the drums and everything so that Chuck could come sound check in 15 right. minutes. And the other preparation was that the musicians were, they were great musicians. Yeah, outstanding. Yep. They knew how to read a chart and, uh, and think on their feet. Yep. Or in their chairs. Yeah. In their chairs. All right. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, Gosh, do you have a recording tip, hack, or like a secret sauce you'd like to share with uh, our rock stars? Uh, side chaining the bass guitar off the kick drum, a compressor. Awesome. Can you can you dig in a little bit deeper? Yeah, you take the kick and set a bus on pre, send it out, and then put a compressor on the uh, on the bass with a side chain input and just get it to squish it like a half dB every kick drum hit, and you can turn up both of them louder. That's awesome. So that kind of lets the kick drum punch through and it scoots the bass out of the way for yeah, just a moment. So you don't have that drums. build up of extra. Uh, what if the bass player is really playing on top? Still cool? Yeah, I do it anyway. All right. I cool. do it on everything. Dig it. Dig it. All right. So um, uh, do you have like maybe a favorite book you've been reading recently? Anything that, that uh, you got excited about? I got that. Um, was it Ken Scott, the Abbey Road guy? He mm-hmm. did the recording, the Beatles book. It was cool. I wish it was more technical, but it was, I mean, that. That stuff is the pinnacle of music to me. It was the Beatles Abbey Road stuff. It's yeah, so and then innovative. there was there was also I, I don't I've forgotten the title of it. I'm uh, it's terrible, but there's know, the me, huge, big. Oh yeah, giant the one Beatles with all the photos out, and everything. Yeah, like yeah, 10 yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, or Abbey that. Road. It was really that, like the Abbey yeah, Road. Book yeah, too. yeah. So yeah, just go read about the Beatles, guys. Well, that guys and, and girls. Tape Up too is wonderful. Yes, Tape Up is a fantastic magazine. If you're not subscribed to it now, it's it's made by Larry Crane. And a great group of writers and editors, and they go around and interview people. Yeah, it's a lot of DIY stuff too. Yeah, it's DIY not just stuff. big names. So, um, and I think it's still a free subscription. Yep, it's free if you're here in the U.S. You have to or something. Renew every six months, I think, or every year. Yeah, so but... just go to the website, just Google Tape Op. Yep. Go subscribe, and you'll have a regular magazine. I don't know if it was monthly or, or a little it, later. I that. think it's monthly. Yeah, come into your yeah, and they do. It, they've got a great online thing now with all the uh, old issues. 
I learned tons of stuff from from Larry and from all those interviews. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so what about a favorite hardware tool in the studio? Could be anything from a tuner to a mic to a favorite piece of gear. We uh, mentioned one on the way in, but that was pretty old school. Well, the thing I've been using lately is I I had a Sansamp GT2, the pedal, and it sat around for years and I hadn't used it. I was thinking about selling it, so I put it on Craigslist and then I had a session come in. And on the rock stuff, I always run a bass amp and like distort the crap out of it. And so um, I was using an OCD. I'm like, man, let's try out this Sans amp. And it's killer. So I took it off Craigslist. Now, is that the original Sans amp pedal that has the little dip switches on it? No, it's the one, it's the next version of it, but it's still got three switches on it. So you can go from like Fender to Mesa Boogie. You know, it's like anywhere in between. It's just a cool, really tight, controlled distortion as opposed to like a like a flabby kind of something where he hits the bass note and it rings for forever. This thing hits and gets off and it, yeah, it's almost gated a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Like a fuzz pedal yeah, or something. It's really, really cool. Yeah. You see right down and right behind you there, I got the original Sans Amp oh, rack unit. Yes. Those are killer too. And then I actually do have the, the guitar pedal too. One of the, the one, the original the one with, with the, all dip the dip switches. switches on yeah. It. yeah. Those are cool too. And, and I could great. never figure it out though. You know, it's like, Oh yeah. I just, I take a pencil. I'm just like hitting them. Yeah. Until move it around to something. Yeah. And then take a photo of it. No, and then I, the thing that really makes it, um, sets it in in a time capsule is that the power supply that came with it, it had one of those original plastic um, lettering, you know, where uh-huh. you punch the letters in the plastic Oh, yeah. Oh, tape over strip. Yeah. yeah. And it had the name or it just said Sans Amp or something. It was stuck on there. <laughs> so it was one Very of the originals. School. Yeah, yeah. This is like back to the mimeograph. Yeah, here. yeah. All right. So um, let's see. Next one. How about a uh, favorite software tool, something that you're using recently? Or oh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, the thing I use for a lot of mastering and people laugh, I use an old version of T-Rex. Oh, okay. Because it's IK Multimedia and um, it sounds so much better than anything else. I don't know what it is. It's got this, they, they make a new version. It's not as cool. It's T-Rex, right. T-Rex 3 and there's like five plugins on it, I guess. Yeah. And it just sounds killer and you can get stuff. Not that this is good, but you can get stuff really, really loud with it. Can you do? Can you use this as a plugin, right? Yeah, they they've got plugin versions, but it sounds better when you're outside of Pro Tools. Oh, so it's an app, standalone. Yeah, app. yeah. Can you install an older version? Can you find the old version still and put it on a newer computer? Uh, yeah, it it still works. Um, I'm still Pro Tools nine okay. and ten six eight, but I think it'll run. Yeah, it, it's kind of a, you know, it's just. It's not a crazy app. It's pretty yeah. simple. So yeah. it should work, but it's T-Rex 3. It's it's really, really cool. Okay, killer. And I know T-Rex does have the newer version yeah, too, which may, like may ton, not be as cool, but it still does a ton of stuff. Yeah, it does. And they, they have a ton more plugins with it too, but it, it's, it sounds good. It gets close. All right, cool. So next question is, um, do you have uh, something that is like a great resource for the business part of the recording studio and what you do? It could uh, be like anything. It could be software. It could be... Uh, well, odd, oddly enough... Uh, for me, Facebook is a huge resource. It's okay. like all the people, I mean, it's all industry people for me. And it's just staying up. You know, if you have like a new SoundCloud demo page or whatever, you know, you put a link up there and all these people see it. And it's good. And, and for the studio, for County Q too, because it's more dynamic than a web page. You know, you put a web page up and it'll sit there until somebody updates at Facebook you can say, hey, this is what's going on today. This is who we have in. And it, it's just, uh, we found it's a good it's a good resource for me in networking yeah. with people. Yeah, it just keeps you in touch with everybody. Right? Yeah. In fact, you reached out and sent me a Facebook message. Yeah, that's online. right. Yeah. That's why we're here in this room. Yeah, exactly. Or part of why. Yeah. Part of why we're here right now. All right, so here's the last, you know, like uh, metaphysical question here is, okay. uh, if you were uh, dropped in a strange city and you could only take a simple setup for recording... What would you choose? How would you find people to record? And how would you make ends meet right away so that you could continue recording? Basically, translation, you're a brand new young right. rock star right. student, listener to this. You just landed in Nashville, New York, LA, or some other city, and you're ready to start your recording career, and you got to figure out what to do. Yeah, I just get a, a laptop and a inbox or whatever, something with a couple pre's, get two match mics. Um go out and record live music, you know, and, and that's how you'd find bands is just go to a lot of shows to meet people. I mean, that's what I do today. You know, I go out and I find bands and you say, Hey, I like your stuff. Do you want to record it? You know? And they're usually like, no, we just did our record, you yeah. know, but, um, making ends meet, I'd probably deliver pizzas. You know, there, there's, 
somebody breaking into it, it's, it's hard to make ends. It's hard to make ends meet when you're established these days. Yeah. But, um, you know, you'll probably have to do something else at first. But yeah. keep after it and keep finding people. And it's just networking. You know, it's making friends and, and building those relationships. And, you know, that's how I got the Mad Anthony Band is through Hurts to Laugh. And the Tom pa- Pappas collection was through Hurts to Laugh. And then my other friend, I got Hurts to Laugh through another friend, you know. So it's just knowing people and then you get put together and you find out whether you're compatible or not. Do you remember being aware of the struggle of like trying to balance, you know, the work and having a preset schedule, but at the same time, the recording world, you seem to have to be available for anything yeah. at any time. Yeah. It's, it's really, really tough. I mean, you know, because like today I was getting ready to come over here and I had a client called 11 and say, I need more bottom end on these mixes. So I had to like, Run over to the You're studio. Like, go sit on your iPhone then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I had to run into the studio and like do a 15 minute mastering job just so I could get it over to him, mm. you know. And I was almost had to push this back, but I went in and did it real quick. But it's stuff like that, you know, you just have to be flexible. And it's tough, you know, there's a couple guys at the studio that were just fabulous, they were amazing, but they have to keep their regular jobs because the work is so intermittent these days especially for somebody coming up that they couldn't really lock into the full-time thing at the studio and and they're awesome you know they come out when they can and and, uh they work there when they can but you know it's just tough so you know i I feel like you can do so much now with a laptop yeah you know a wall outlet and a single microphone even yep you can make records that you know if i was starting this all over again i would look for the absolute dirt cheapest place for me to live, you know, have a roommate, be in a, in a rented apartment with enough space to just kind of sit there in headphones and and make records and do my thing. And, you know, leave myself that freedom and flexibility to make the stuff great. Yeah. But also like, you know, the sooner you get to that place where you, you put yourself in a work quickly phrase or a frame of mind Yeah. and you don't spend forever and ever and ever trying to polish your one nickel, you know, that's your, that's the mix you just did. Mm -hmm. Um, the sooner you're going to get more experience. Too. Well, you know, and the thing forward. is make decisions, hopefully make good decisions, make them quickly and stand by them. You yeah. Know? And the bean burrito at Taco Bell too. I remember that was about a dollar. Yeah. And I was like, yep. sweet. Yep. I'm covered. Every yep. meal I need, I just yep. got to go drive through and spend a dollar and get yeah. a glass of water and I'm good to go. Yeah. You know, it's tough, but if you stick with it and uh, you pursue it, there's no reason you can't be very successful. Awesome. Well, so tell our listeners, our rock stars, how they can find you, Mike. Uh, do you have do you have uh, some online presence? Uh, let's see. The there's the Six Minor Films website, and that's the number six m i n o r films dot com. I'm on Facebook. It's Mike Purcell. I'm sure this will pop up somewhere. P u r c e u r c e l l, which is a good resource for me. County Q's on Facebook, and it's. Uh, the word county and then just the letter Q. It's not like the headphone Q. So uh, those are all the places to find me. So I'm around. Awesome. Are you guys still selling the software for Radar? No, we're not. Not doing it's that. It's a OS 9 thing. So okay, cool. Too hard to port over. Right on. Well, thanks so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm honored to have you on here as my first guest. And, Thank uh, you. What an awesome show, dude. Thank Great you. stories. Cool. Great way to start. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text R.S. Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's R.S. Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.